Welcome to the Ultimate Grinder Showdown. Here we're going to take five of the most sought after grinders for the home and pit them head to head in a battle to the death? Maybe not the death, but they're going to battle it out to see which is the best or ultimately which one I would recommend to you. Now, I've made a video on each of these different grinders already. If you want to check that, there's links in the description. There's a little playlist up here as well. If you just want to watch those before we get stuck in, they'll give you more info on the grinders, their backgrounds, some of the technical details behind them. But to refresh your memory, starting over here, we have the Lagom P64, 64 mil burrs, variable RPM. We've got the Weber Workshops EG1, 80 mil burrs, variable RPM. We've got the Monolith Max by Cafetech, 98 mil burrs, variable RPM. The Levercraft Ultra, 98 mil burrs, variable RPM. And on the end, the Malkernig EK43S, 98 mil burrs, but fixed speed motor. We're going to put them through a battery of tests, uh, and some will be subjective, that will involve me tasting and telling you what I think, and some will be objective, things around retention and other kinds of performance too. We're going to start off with some espresso tasting first of all. I'm going to be pulling shots of all of these and I'll try and talk to you about how they taste different, which ones I like more than others. I'll explain a bit more about that in a second. Then to give my palate a little bit of a break, we'll do some objective testing. We'll do retention and I've got a couple of interesting tests there. Then we'll do some filter coffee testing where we'll do both pour over and immersion brews to see how they perform within that kind of sphere of coffee brewing. And then finally, a few more little objective tests around uh, speed and noise and that kind of stuff. And then I'll wrap up and give you my recommendations. So now I'm going to dial all of these in. I'm going to dial them all in on a flat nine bar profile with this machine. We'll use a different profile afterwards with a different machine. Uh, I'm going to pull shots of each one and I'll tell you how those shots taste. Now it won't be a blind test today, so I understand that now. I actually want to bring in my experience over the last couple of months with these grinders tasting coffee, tasting shots, when I talk about how the espressos taste. Otherwise evaluating an entire grinder on a single shot of espresso is a little bit silly and redundant. But if I'm talking about that espresso and bringing in my experience with the grinder, I, I hope I can give you a little bit more information. Let's dial in now. We're going to be doing an 18 gram dose in, we're going to be doing a 40 gram dose out. Slightly longer than two to one should be a fairly level playing field for all the grinders. Now when I'm tasting these, I'm going to be stirring them, sipping them and spitting them out again and rinsing aggressively to try and keep my palate going through this tasting. I'll also give you a score across a number of factors like sweetness, clarity and texture and maybe an overall score. These aren't particularly meaningful, I'm just trying to communicate to you how the shots are different with some pretty simple numbers. I'll use some descriptors too but I won't wax lyrical about each of the shots because you're not tasting what I'm tasting and I'm just trying to communicate to you what the espresso is like. Now, time for the first shot from the Legom P64 from option O. This espresso has nice texture. I would score it maybe an eight out of 10 for texture. Sweetness is pleasant, but probably a seven. I know that this probably could have a little bit more sweetness, but it's, it's pretty well extracted. I would say a seven again for balance. This is a very enjoyable espresso, so don't, don't get me wrong. A 10 across the board would be a life-changing kind of thing here. So it, it's, it's nicely textured. It's nicely extracted. I feel it's got a little bit more that it could give, but, but it is still a balanced, enjoyable shot. Very nice finish. So overall, probably, a, probably like a seven, seven and a half. It's a, it's a very nice shot of espresso. Let's move on. Espresso from the EG1. Texture is very nice. It feels textured and balanced and full and rich. Uh, enjoyable there, I'd probably give that an eight. Uh, sweetness, again, it is clean, it is pronounced. It is a kind of eight out of 10 for sweetness, quite enjoyable. Balance, again, probably an eight. This is a very enjoyable shot. It's performing very well here. It, it lacks a little bit for clarity, but not a huge amount. But if I was to pick it apart, that would be where I'd be like, oh, a little, little fussier there. But overall, a very enjoyable shot, eight out of 10. Definitely enjoy this really a lot. So the Monolith Max. What you notice up front here is, is sweetness, actually. This is quite a strong, intense sweetness. It's very pleasant. Uh, uh, I'm gonna say eight and a half, nine for sweet. Like, really nice sweetness in this espresso. Clarity is also pretty good, kind of an eight. Um, texture. Probably a seven. It's it's pleasant. It's just not as full as the the previous two shots. Its concentration feels high. Its extraction feels quite high. Um, it, it is a very very enjoyable espresso shot for me. It's like an eight eight and a half overall. That sweetness really does appeal to me. It's very nicely extracted. Yeah, this is delicious. Very good espresso. Evercraft Ultra. Interesting little shot. Sweetness very nice. Quite present. Quite strong sweetness. Uh, probably an eight for sweetness. I would say the texture is a little 
lighter here, this feels more of a unimodal style espresso where you have um, just a little less texture for your extraction. Probably was a seven for the texture. Uh, balance, clarity are really there, kind of like a, kind of a nine in that regard, like tons of clarity, really quite a balanced shot, nice finish, but just missing that texture. Overall, it's an eight. It's a very good shot, but I, I would want just a touch more texture in those espressos, but tons of clarity. EK43 shot. That is a tasty espresso. It doesn't have a super pronounced sweetness. I would say a solid eight there. It has nice texture. I would say another eight there. It has nice clarity. It's another eight there. It's a good all rounder shot. It has enough texture to not feel like it's a super, super linear espresso. You'll hear me use the word unimodal a lot today, I suspect. Uh, and that's a grind distribution thing where there's a peak of, of particle sizes and there aren't tons of fines, there aren't tons of boulders. Most things are, are one size. And that's considered in many cases highly desirable. But with espresso, it, it is more complicated. That though is a nice espresso. It's kind of like a straight eights kind of shot. So very tasty, very tasty indeed. Now, as a kind of interlude between this round of testing and the next, it, it seemed appropriate to bring in some sort of benchmark. A grinder I've talked about before, and that is the much, much, much cheaper Conical Bird niche grinder. This is 500 pounds, um, a third of the price, pretty much, of, of the cheapest one of the grinders that I'm testing. It's Conical Burr, all the others are flat. So for the money, how big is the difference? There's a couple things that spring to mind here. Firstly, this is just a little less extracted tasting than the others there. It has a little bit more acidity, a little bit more harshness compared to the others. It's not a bad shot. I'm not saying it doesn't taste good. I'm just saying the others have um, initially a little bit more extraction and therefore a little bit more balance. If I was to rate this for balance, I would say something like a six. In terms of sweetness, six to seven. It has some sweetness, it's quite nice. In terms of texture, yeah, probably like a seven again. In terms of clarity, that's again where it falls down in comparison to some of these grinders here. These very large flat burrs seem to just give you uh, just that, that extra nudge more clarity. And by clarity, it's a tricky word, I mean it's easier to pick apart flavors. There's a kind of comparative muddiness to this compared to the others. It's still a nice shot. It's still an enjoyable shot. And, and by saying it's a six out of 10, that feels harsh in comparison to some of the other stuff but it's up against some of the best grinders in the world that have scored sevens and eights here. And again, I do just wanna clarify, these numbers are completely arbitrary, right? I'm just trying to communicate differences uh, with numbers uh, as a communication tool. They're, they don't mean anything. It's not something worth like sticking in front of this grinder. This is a six out of 10 shot grinder. That makes no sense whatsoever. I'm just trying to communicate differences to you. Now, let's get on with pulling some interesting shots with the Decent. We're gonna run some interesting longer profiles that have much longer pre-infusions. They're gonna push these grinders into a finer place uh, and see what happens if we just brew a different style of espresso. So what we're using is a slightly tweaked version of the Cremina profile on the Decent. That involves a very long pre-infusion, kind of a soaking phase, and then it ramps up a little bit and then slowly ramps down again. Mimicking a long pre-infusion on a lever machine, and it pushes you to grind much finer. The total shot time is around 48 to 50 seconds for that same 18 in and 40 out. Instead of going through shot by shot again and taking a really long time, I'm gonna do that quick tasting of the five espressos back to back and I'll give you a quick summary at the end of it uh, of some differences and things that I found that were interesting. So having tasted a bunch more espresso, I kind of feel like nothing I tasted particularly changed my mind about how I felt about these grinders to start with. The world of espresso, once you factor in stuff like changing profiles of pressure or flow, it, it just becomes expansive and huge. These are all incredibly capable grinders. They do produce different styles of espresso and I stand behind how I've sort of described them to date and there has kind of been a, a summary of my experience over the last couple of months using them uh, every day here in the studio. When it comes to choosing a grinder based on taste, know that with all of these grinders, you can change the burr sets out and with that will come enormous change. And so that's why it's been important to me in the other reviews to talk about workflow and, and those kind of aspects. We'll now move into two rounds of retention testing. Here in the first round, we're gonna do a simple experiment. We're gonna pre-weigh out three doses of coffee at 18 grams exactly, and we're gonna grind them and see what comes out each time. With each of the grinders, we'll go with their recommended workflows in terms of uh, using bellows, if they come with bellows, removing magnetic funnels and, and sweeping them out, all that kind of stuff, just to see how they do. These are all single dose grinders, and what you really wanna see is if you put 18 grams in, you really want 18 grams out. So I'll be back in a second to tell you the results of that test and also tell you about the second retention test. 
So I'm looking at the results here, and it was an interesting test. The, the grinders that did the best were the ones that you could almost take to pieces to completely sweep out. Both the Ultra and the Monolith Max did incredibly well. Across the board, the grinders did very well. The variance of about 0.1 of a gram, I think, is beyond acceptable in these kind of scenarios. The EK did have a little bit of a tricky time where it seemed to sort of retain a chunk of coffee, 0.3 of a gram, one time that kind of came out into the next one, which gave it a much larger variation in its sort of dose to dose, and that can happen. You know, getting everything out of the EK is a little trickier. I will say, points to the uh, EG1 here, there was no process to go through. There were no bellows, there was no disassembly of anything, there was no ritual to go through. It just spat out pretty much what you put in, and the sweeper system inside that grinder is very effective. So, points there. Now, the second retention test is a little bit different, because I want to look at the idea of exchange a little bit more. What exactly is being retained, and how much is kind of being exchanged? You know, is, is some coffee always retained, but, you know, the old coffee gets pushed out by the new, but then some you know, new coffee becomes the old coffee trapped inside. So to test that, I have, a, I hope, a very simple test. All the grinders will be dialed in for espresso, and they'll pull a shot, and we'll just log that shot time. Then we'll move them all to approximately, like, a V60 setting and grind through 20 grams of coffee. Then we'll pull them back to their grind setting for espresso and pull a shot. If they have no exchange going on, if nothing is really retained meaningfully, they should pull a very normal espresso shot straight away. If they are retaining and exchanging some coffee, that next shot of espresso will have some of that coarser grind in it, and I would expect the grinders to produce a kind of faster flowing espresso if they have a higher quantity of coffee exchanging whenever you grind. So I hope that retention test makes sense. Let's see what the results are. Now I will put the results of this test up on screen so you can see what I'm talking about, and I'll try and make sense of these results. I think they're very insightful, and they do correlate with the retention test that we did first. Looking through at the first couple of grinders, the P64 and the EG1, both of them, uh, after they'd had a, a sort of a session of coarse grinding, the next shot was a little bit faster, and the shot after that went back to a normal speed again. That indicated that there was a little bit of coffee retained inside the grinder at that coarser grind that sort of needed to be worked out. That means I would recommend purging a small amount when making large changes with these grinders. The next two, the Monolith Max and the Levercraft Ultra, both did really, really well in this test, and again, they were the, the best performing on the retention perspective as well. Now, it might look like the Max initially didn't do that well. The first shot was 30 seconds, then we coarsely ground coffee, and then the next shot was 27 seconds, but the shot after that was also 27 seconds, indicating that I might have just moved the grinder to not quite a fine enough position. I thought I'd got it right, but I could have made a mistake there, and the fact that those two shots ran identically one after the other indicates that there really wasn't any coarsely ground coffee left behind from that coarser grinding session. It had all been gotten rid of. The worst performer here by far was the EEK43S. The retention uh, on the first test wasn't very good, and the retention on this test certainly wasn't very good. That shot, after we coarsely ground some coffee and moved it back to position, ran really, really fast. And the shot after that, same position, got back to a nearly normal flow rate again. So clearly there was coarser ground coffee retained inside it. So yeah, if you're making big changes with an EK, I would also recommend purging a small amount of coffee through that grinder. It might only need to be three, four, five grams, but something should go through just to make sure that you're exchanging any of that sort of coarsely ground coffee for some finer ground coffee. So that's it for espresso testing for now we're gonna look at some filter coffee. We're gonna look at pour overs, and I've racked my brain about an effective way to do this, and, and it, it is a tricky one. I don't wanna just go and, and sort of find out how fine I can go while it still tastes good, because pour overs are a percolation brew, and if you watched that recent video on immersion versus percolation, you'll know that technique is the ceiling here, not necessarily the grinder. So here, I'm gonna set them all to a very similar extraction level for a pour over. I'm gonna aim for about 22% extraction. It's a little bit arbitrary, I absolutely give you that, but I'll be using a refractometer to dial them in identically, and then I'll taste them and compare them. I'll be curious to see how big the differences really are. So we're ready for the tasting part now, and I'm actually really excited about this. Now, this is not a blind tasting, because the idea that I would judge a grinder on a single cup of coffee is completely absurd. I'm going to use this comparative tasting because it's really interesting for me as well to, to do this comparatively, but I, I do want to bring with me the experience of brewing coffee on these grinders over the last couple of months. I will say, it, it looks like this is shot in one day. This video has been shot over multiple days to, uh, you know, combat palate fatigue as well. Let's get into some tasting. Now, as I said, these have all been dialed in to a very similar extraction level. 
um, and one that was below the point at which it was sort of too fine for a V60 technique to work, where you get a lot of channeling and that kind of stuff. So they're all very well extracted and they all taste very nice. I think what you see again is that I have the high uniformity burr set here in the P64, a burr set optimized around espresso because it gives a slightly wider particle distribution. And I think you can taste that here. It has just a little bit more texture, which some people might really enjoy, but it has a little less clarity of flavor than some of the other cups here. Interestingly, what you saw from a drawdown perspective is that this had the slowest drawdown, whereas the two grinders, I think, are sort of hitting high uniformity the most effectively, which would be uh, the Monolith Max and the Levercraft Ultra, they had the quickest drawdowns. The EK and the EG, both had sort of similar drawdowns. The, the EK was actually slightly slower, that was interesting. So moving into the EG1, really a, a very nice sweet brew, no real astringency, this sort of higher extraction, very pleasant, nice clarity, just very enjoyable, no complaints here. And even though again, it feels like a burr set that is not optimized for espresso necessarily, but, but you know, slightly less uniform. It feels like in comparison to the P64, the EG1 has a little bit more uniformity and you can taste that in a little bit more clarity. What about the Max? This is an interesting cup to me. You know, this grinder I feel is optimized around espresso brewing and more unimodal style espresso brewing. The cup here is again sweet and that's been a feature that we've come up against a, a couple times with this grinder. It is, to some extent, like possibly lacking a little complexity compared to some of the others, but it is incredibly enjoyable. I'm aware I'm nitpicking right now because you don't usually get to compare these grinders side by side. And if I was just drinking this cup of coffee, I'd be having a very nice time. It is very enjoyable. It feels perhaps a little bit more linear, uh, not simple necessarily, but, but just lacking a touch of complexity compared to the others. Tasting the Levercraft, I say compared to the others, but these two cups are to me the, the most similar. They're different, and, and there's actually a little bit less texture in the Ultra, which is interesting. It's quite a kind of light, bright, sweet, nice complexity, but not quite as full, even though it's a similar kind of extraction. I cannot infer what that means, I can only tell you what it tastes like. Again, I've enjoyed brewed coffee from this grinder very much, it's tasted very nice indeed. The EK here is performing well, but I feel it is a little outshone. I'm not sure exactly which burr set is in the EK right now. I feel like they've changed it around a few times recently. This is a very nice cup. It doesn't have any flaws necessarily. Uh, it just lacks a little bit of the clarity that many of the other cups here have. It has texture, it has some sweetness. You know, you can taste the coffee there. It's important to clarify just how close these are, you know, in, in the wider context of good and bad coffee, these are all absolutely clustered up at the very end of very good. And it's kind of by zooming into that that we're picking apart the differences. This is all very tasty. So there's one piece of testing we did that I think was very interesting. We ground some coffee to test the speed of sort of throughput of the grinders, and at the same time compared the sort of sound levels they produce running empty and running grinding. Now this was pretty simple to do. We put the, the decibel meter a fixed distance from the grinders each time and we ran it with and without coffee. And here are the results. Now what I will say about the, the sound levels in particular is that they don't tell the whole story. Decibels don't tell you how pleasant the sound was. So alongside this information, I'll give you my ranking of nicest sounding to least nice sounding. At the top, the nicest sounding grinder is the Levercraft. It, it, it is the least offensive sounding to me when it's grinding coffee. Second is probably the P64. Third probably is the Monolith. It's technically the quietest, but it doesn't sound quite as pleasant as the others. Fourth would be the EG1. And fifth is the EK43 because it is just so much louder than the others and it's quite an abrasive sound because it's so loud. In terms of productivity, in terms of how quickly they grind, this was an interesting test. Uh, in particular because uh, I think it speaks to the fact that RPM is not everything when it comes to speed. And I think people correlate them a little bit too closely. Even though I was using grinders at different RPMs, really it's the burr set that will drive this. And that's best illustrated by the fact that if you run the Monolith Max at 350 and the Levercraft Ultra at 350, there is a huge, huge difference in grinding time. The Levercraft is just much, much, much faster than the Monolith. I'm not here to say that's good or bad. I'm just here to highlight the differences in speed between the grinders. Now I think we should probably wrap up. 
and I'll talk through each of the grinders and give a kind of summary of my thoughts and share which one or ones were my favourites. So how do I summarise the glorious absurdity of this particular video, of all of this testing? Because I feel like a spoilt brat complaining about the nicest toys money can buy. They're all fantastic grinders. Um, I'll have little complaints about it, all of them, but I will say they all do a great job of making delicious coffee. So by way of a summary, I'll tell you who I think might be the perfect candidate for each of these grinders. So the Lagon P64 from Option O. I think if you're a bit space constrained, if you're a little bit budget constrained compared to the rest of the stuff here, then it makes for an excellent choice. If you're looking for something for an espresso setup, then yeah, I think the high uniformity burrs work super well. Yes, they're a little bit smaller in terms of burr size than the rest of them here, but I, I don't feel like it's a massive compromise from that perspective. If you were looking for something to do a bit of both, that, that's a harder choice to me because, you know, you're not realistically going to be switching burrs very often, as easy as it is to do with this grinder. But I think for espresso particularly, it's a pretty great choice. The EG1 is the most expensive grinder, but I think from a build and construction perspective, you can absolutely see where your money is going. It, it, it's incredibly well built, it's incredibly thoughtfully built. The detail is there throughout. And in terms of performance, it's a great all-rounder. If you need great espresso, great filter coffee, and something that is sympathetic to that workflow, this is a great choice. But it's very expensive, but I understand why, and I, I don't think it's overpriced for what you're getting in the world of high-end grinders. The Monolith Max, again, very, very expensive, and it feels more focused from a workflow and build perspective around espresso. And it does perform well for espresso too, really well. I really enjoy the shots from this, very delicious. It does perform well for filter coffee, but I feel like the workflow isn't optimized the same way that a grinder like this might be. However, if I had the budget and I just brewed espresso all the time, I, I would be tempted by this grinder. The Levercraft Ultra, to me, kind of feels like it belongs in, a, in an espresso lab, somewhere where you'd have the space to accommodate all of it, as well as a place where you'd want to do the kind of experiments that only this grinder lets you do. Grinding at different RPM feels like you're at the fringe of espresso experimentation, and then throwing an RPM profiling feels like you're at the fringe of that fringe. Uh, like, it, it is a brave new world. I don't know what will come of it, but if you are the sort of person that wants to do those kind of experiments, this is an interesting option. It's performance was excellent, it was enjoyable to use. I, I didn't love the build as much as some of the others, but, but it is a well-made grinder. The Malconic E64 has one singular advantage over all the rest of them. If you need to grind more than 50 grams of coffee at a time, well, really, this is it. This is a workhorse. It's built to do high volumes. It's built to be in a cafe. Most of these other grinders are expressly built for the home. You know, these are built for the home and not for cafes. This is built for a cafe, but this is really built to be uh, a jack of all trades in a commercial environment. If you want that performance at home, I, I understand why you might choose this, but I just don't think it's optimized for a home experience. I don't think it's optimized for the workflow of making either filter coffee or espresso, especially at home. But commercially speaking, it, it, it's the only one I would consider putting into a cafe. And for that reason, it sort of doesn't belong in this grouping, but because people are buying them for the home, it seemed necessary to include it in this testing group. So if I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, which would I pick? And to be honest, I'd be torn between these two grinders here, the two most expensive ones. I think for my personal applications, where I'm brewing a lot of different coffee, where I'm brewing espresso, I'm brewing filter, and I'm bouncing around all over the place, this might be the winner. For me, the workflow, the performance, all of those things work for my particular needs, and so this is probably my favorite grinder of these ones here. But it just pips the monolith, which I really enjoyed using, fantastic performance, and again, if my workflow was even more espresso heavy than it is now, this might have been an even more difficult decision for me to make. Now, if you're watching this and you've got something like a, a, a Baratza Sete or a Wilfi Uniform or a Fellow Ode or something like that, one of those kind of grinders, I don't want you to think that you're massively missing out on your coffee experience. Here, we're really talking about chasing down, you know, those diminishing returns, and they are diminishing returns. Yes, you could taste the difference between these two grinders. If you took a mid-range grinder and any one of these things, yes, you would taste the difference, but it's pretty small. In the great scheme of coffee, from bad coffee to okay coffee to great coffee, you're really working within a small section of quality. 
So, so you should know what your money gets you if you ever chose to spend more, and it does improve coffee, but it is an incremental improvement. But for those of us obsessed with the details and wanting to go as far as we can, well, that's why these grinders exist. Now, I don't get to keep any of these. These all get given away to my Patreon backers. They have allowed me to go and buy these five incredible grinders, put them up on the bench, compare them, contrast them, and experiment, and honestly, I've learned a ton. I've enjoyed all of this, and I hope you've enjoyed coming along with me on this little journey. If you haven't watched their individual reviews, then go and check those out. There's a bit more uh, nitpicking, a bit more history, a bit more background on each of the grinders if you want to know more, and I'd love to hear from you now, down in the comments below. Which was your favourite? Which one would suit your application the best? But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.